And you're listening to WPKN 89.5 FM Bridgeport, listener community free speech alternative radio. I'm Dr. Z, Dr. Eugene Zampro, naturopathic physician herbalist, and together with my illustrious producer and co-host and good friend, Ma Joseph, we bring you this great information on health, wellness, alternative medicine. This is the natural house call segment. And uh, we have a great guest here. We're going to be talking about Tibetan medicine, which is sounds so exotic. I always wanted to go to Tibet, and it's on my bucket list one of these days. But we have Dr. <laughs> Javier Palacios to be talking about that, and he's a naturopathic physician and a graduate of the University of Bridgeport. And he did an extensive research and writing into Tibetan medicine, so he certainly is more scholarly on it than most people that I've discussed. So let's bring him on, and we'll get going with our um, discussion. Welcome, Javier. Nice to see you. Welcome, Dr. Z, and good morning to everybody out there, radio listeners. Great, great. I'm ho so happy that you joined us. So tell us a little bit about yourself first. You know, we need to know about our, our guest that's uh, here live in the studios. It's so nice to have you on here. So you're a naturopathic physician. What is a naturopathic physician? You know, I, I assume that everyone knows that, um, even though <laughs> they've been listening to me for many years, they may not even know a little bit about naturopathic medicine. And I know you're pretty much steeped in the philosophy of naturopathic medicine and have every every naturopathic physician has a little bit different philosophy. Tell us about yours, Javier. Sure. So um, naturopathic medicine, for me, it holds a very special place in my heart because it's been something that I've been looking for for all of these years, ever since I was interested in medicine in general. Okay. okay. Um, how I became interested in naturopathic medicine compared to normal allopathic medicine or conventional medicine comes back to the philosophy and how our, our bodies have this ability to heal ourselves from disease and the ability to have this support from yeah, nature exactly, exactly. and how I became interested was actually from Buddhism Oh, interesting. So, so you were weren't interested in like some people are interested in in becoming like a conventional doctor, but they're not interested in the drugs or surgery. But you actually got interested through spiritual practice. Yes, exactly. Because in my at the age of in our teen days, we that's the time of rebellion where we want to be our own persona, mm -hmm. and my seeking for that became in through the seeking of meditation. And I was just reading through the different works, how meditation works. And obviously, meditation in today's society is mostly um, known in Buddhism. Because in Buddhist temples, that's the major thing that is being practiced. And I was able to realize that through this teachings of the mind, teachings of meditation, and then coming to the naturopathic philosophies and tenets of how the body heals itself, it was very parallel on how the mind heals itself as it goes through the different stages of trauma and different stages of realization. It was very, very similar. So what are some of the principles of Buddhism that kind of uh, inter intertwine with naturopathic medicine? Yeah, so one of the biggest and correlates that I was able to find is that the mind will suppress any disease or any condition that we are not ready to accept until we are stronger inside. Mm -hmm. In other words, in naturopathic medicine, we also have the belief that, you know, we, as we get a symptom, it's our body's manifestation of showing something to us. It's I a see, way of, see, yeah. but if we take just palliative medications, meaning things that would just help us remove the symptoms, but we're not addressing the root cause of the disease, then it gets 
shoved in into our bodies. Similarly with the mind, that comes into the aspect of suppression, the suppressive active action of the mind, which protects us in the, f in the first long run and at first, but in the long run, obviously, it's going to start affecting us and we're going to have triggers right. that we do not know why it comes back, but it was because of this suppression that we've been doing. And obviously, this is something, it's a behavioral problem. So we don't want to we don't want to deal with our innermost uh, thoughts, feelings, emotions, traumas, etc. So we kind of stuff it internally. Does that get locked into the organ systems? I know that kind of s starts us into our discussion of Tibetan medicine because I know in many disciplines they don't really look at that. You know, like in Western medicine, they may there's psychiatry and psychology and whatnot, which you know does believe that but more in psychiatry it's it's more about molecules and neurotransmitters and things like that not sort of hol holograph holism where the body is like a hologram stuffing things what's your thoughts on that yeah so i do believe that when we suppress our emotions they do get stored somewhere in our bodies mm -hmm. and it has come to my realization is that it is a mind body complex it shouldn't be the mind and the body. They shouldn't be, they're not separate entities. And and obviously that's where my interest in Tibetan medicine got involved because it very much addresses that and which get, we'll get in a bit. But yeah, uh, basically my belief or my understanding of how the mind and the body work together is that we get stored, we suppress them and according to our constitution and according to our body types, we are going to express or the body is going to express these problems mm -hmm. according to the organ. And again, it's based on which organ is the weakest, which organ is the most easily of... Um, well, like the emotion itself mm -hmm. can affect different organs, I know. And, and so I guess let's go through the history of... Tibetan medicine because you know Tibet and medicine I'm sure it was intertwined with China on one side and India on another side and has elements of Ayurvedic medicine on one side and traditional Asian type of medicine on the other side tell us a little bit about it yeah so so when it comes to Tibetan medicines there's two main turning points at least that I was interested in one was when it was developed, and then another one was when it was revealed to the Western world. Oh, okay. Because, you know, after all, Tibet was a very isolated area. It was not very much available to people, and obviously the Westerns did not know that Tibet even existed until just a couple hundred they years ago. it was ago. like Shangri-La, like some right. unknown <laughs> place. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Um, but yeah, going back to the first um, how Tibetan medicine started, so even up to the 7th century CE or 700 AD, Tibetan, Tibet was just a very indigenous practice. They had very, their medicine was very much based on their old practices, which in that w time was called Bon. Bon was like the shamanistic religion of Tibet. Mm -hmm. And obviously it was passed orally through traditions. And we can see this in Native American traditions and in many other folklore types of medicines. But after the government, the Tibetan government decided to bring, em all bring together a standardized medicine so people can practice and study together. Because by it was like the golden age of Tibet between the 7th and 8th century AD. Okay. So the monasteries, they all decided to bring experts from all over the place as far as they could go. And the major doctors that they brought in were doctors from uh, Greco-Arabic areas, so Persian, which at the time were practicing uh, Greek 
medicine. Yeah, the, the, the Greco-Romans were interesting. It was based on like Hippocrates, the four humors, Galen, who of course was they called Galen the medical pope because they thought his information was infallible. Remember right. how I talked to you that in history, how yes. he kind of <laughs> became the end all be all. So there was a, so that's Unani Tib, I think they call that. Yes, that type and of medicine, Unani right? was introduced yeah. into the Tibetan system. Interesting. Uh, also, Ayurvedic obviously had the biggest influence. So they brought a lot of Ayurvedic physicians into the mix. Yes. Interesting. Uh, and which we'll get in a bit later as to how Tibetan medicine is very similar to Ayurvedic medicine. But in addition, they also brought n doctors from Nepal and Kashmir who at that time were not Ayurvedic practitioners. They had their own system of medicine. Okay. And then... Um, they also invited very respected physicians of China. So they really brought in a lot of mix. So this was around 700. Yes. So it, so it's transmitting or, or transforming from just pure shamanism and the local traditions, and then it's starting to amalgamate all these different influences then at that point. Right, correct. And it was a time where the Tibetan had their resources, by that time, there were about 5,000 monasteries in the Tibetan Plateau, and they really wanted for them to learn medicine the proper way, because in, Tibetan me in Tibet, you have to learn the sciences through text and memorization, and this included not just um, ritualistic... R and shamanistic work, yeah. Right, it also okay. included medicine, astrology, even painting was considered a science at that time. Yeah, interesting. How? So, what are what are some of the um, aspects of Tibetan medicine that differentiated from a lot of those um, other disciplines? And, mm -hmm. and then eventually, how did it become what you've what you've actually studied? Yeah. So, after eventually gathering together all of those physicians through all of those time, and it took about. Uh, a little less than a hundred years to come up with the major text that Tibetan doctors study today called the four treatises or some people translate as the four tantras and it's pronounced Kuchi in Tibetan and that's where all of the discipline comes in that's where every doctor is expected to memorize it and expected to recite it every wow. day wow. and it is a pretty big book and <laughs> I think I've sh I brought yeah, it one time I, and I've I shown it, it to you it's amazing so it's like they like in Ayurveda I know they had to learn the doctors had to learn it through songs we had uh, Ayurvedic physicians on the program many times including one of the founders of the programs uh, Manny Harris who's very knowledgeable in Ayurveda and um, so they had to learn it through, you know, songs and poems and things like that. So there's an aspect of that in, in Tibetan medicine. Yes, yeah. and yes, and in Tibetan medicine, it first started with just the written aspect. And But the, the interesting part was when the whole spread of Tibet c came after the invasion of China into the plateau, that's when they realized that they had to systemize, systemize the whole Tibetan medicine because even though they were very unified they still in according to the plateau and according to the location they will practice a little bit of different medicine which is similar to what happened to China mm. before it became a standardized system because in one side of China they will practice pulse differently another oh, side of I China see, see, acupuncture yeah. will be used a little bit differently mm. but after that they came up with pictures and they're now in the Tibetan, the major Tibetan book, the Four Tantras, you will see a lot of pictures and that will obviously help the learner memorize because with pictures, it is a little bit easier for them so to So what understand. types of things do they have to memorize? I, I clearly, like any doctor, they probably have to memorize how to take a case, what to look for, how do they diagnose without doing like blood lab tests like the way we do in the western medicine you know because in naturopathic medicine we blend the modern right lab tests and whatnot with the ancient stuff so how do they how do they go about all that 
Yeah, so that's that's where we're gonna get into the okay. Tibetan, the real meaty aspect of Tibetan medicine. So, for example, you will go see a Tibetan doctor, and say I had high blood pressure. Let's just because that's. Yeah. I was thinking what one illness seems to be so common in America, and so many people are on high blood pressure pills. Tell us, a, like, use that maybe, or, or, or whatever analogy or, or illness you, you prefer, Dr. Palacio. Yeah. So I will get into the example in a bit, but yeah, I do okay. want to I do wanna mention it to the, the actual Tibetan practice. Okay. So in Tibetan medicine, they have, they use a lot of analogies using trees between the root, the stems, and the leaves. Hmm. It's a lot of analogies from that, which is kind of similar to what naturopathic medicine does use too mm-hmm. um, by the way in Tibetan medicine they have the descriptions of a healthy body and the descriptions of a diseased body and that's where it comes in a little bit of the philosophy and just not to get too much into the philosophy I do want to explain a little bit because again it is very similar to Buddhism but for obvious reasons that Tibet is largely Buddhist and it has been so ever since the spread of Buddhism in like the 500 AD but in Tibet they had a tantric aspect so they mixed Tantra and Buddhism so it's a little bit different in that aspect and basically what's the difference between Tantric Buddhism and other types of Buddhism is that in Tantric Buddhism male and females are equal and at that time it was a little bit different it wasn't something that we will see at much during those um, times there mm, interesting okay but um, yeah going into how Tibetan medicine works is so basically they have the belief in reincarnation as you pass on you move your consciousness or they call it the mind continuum into the next body and so on and so forth until you come to a full time realization of enlightenment that you know we are not what we think we are and they call that ignorance the ability to not know what our true nature is and that ignorance is what keeps keeps us from moving forward and moving up from this realm of humans and this mind continuum then comes into the body and it produces these energy bodies they call it the three channels the main channels the central channel the lunar channel and the solar channel Mm -hmm. and that's kind of where astrology comes in into the game as well because a Tibetan doctor is supposed to know astrology just as much as medicine Um, and then obviously these three channels give rise to the three humors that we're so um, so they talk about three humors. Yes. A, s- a lot of systems, it's four humors and different doshas or, or constitutions, but three humors then. So that's yeah. a little different. Okay. Yeah. So the three humors, they were obviously named after the Ayurvedic doshas, the constitution. Oh, I see. Okay. However, they, even though they do have similar qualities, similar aspects, for, for example, the Vata, Pitta, and Kapha in that's what those are the three doshas in Ayurvedic medicine and you know it kind of depends on the type of person you know like a vata will be a very skinny tall um, nervous maybe yeah nervous they're on their minds a lot right. in Tibetan medicine that's called wind which basically is the translation of vata wind yeah exactly yeah so the wind but they don't call it constitution they call it humor humor or poison Poison? Yes. (laughs) And I'll get to that in a bit, why they call it poison. (laughs) But obviously the next one is bile or pitta. Bile. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of like the substance our liver makes and gallbladder stores. Yes. And in the energetic body, the Tibetans believe that that's where it stores. The body, in the middle aspect of the body, that's where the bile is, specifically from the liver. And obviously that will be a very choleric type of person in, in using Greek words right you know so explain what the, explain how they would act then say yeah so a pitta or a 
bile type of individual will be somebody who's who has just outbursts very easily easy outburst they are very impatient they're irritable they they probably have very high blood pressure because of all of that anger that's being suppressed but at the same time if they're able to control it they have like the most at one of the utmost compassion out of everybody is that right okay. because they're able to understand where the anger comes in oh, interesting. and then the last humor that Tibetan medicine talks about is um, in Ayurveda it's called kapha but in, me in Tibetan medicine it's called phlegm Flem. which is kind of similar to uh, Greek medicine but they also have a phlegmatic <laughs> type of individual which is very and, and even Chinese them. medicine too has yes sort of phlegm so this is where it's all amalgamated. and that's where it blends in exactly because they understand what phlegm is and from the Chinese tradition so phlegm is not just what we cough up from our lungs right what are some of the aspects of phlegm the aspects of phlegm will be somebody who's very sed sedative who doesn't really move much mm -hmm. so obviously they tend to be overweight and they even in their minds they tend to be very slow they're not able to understand the, the big pictures about mm -hmm. things mm -hmm. so and they're also very damp they're not really good with cold they're chilly all the time mm -hmm. so a, a phlegm person will be somebody who's just sitting watching tv all day sedentary very sedentary very sedentary <laughs> <laughs> so they could get those types of illnesses i guess from the body fluids not moving too much and just you know right and that's where the term poison comes in instead of calling it oh, dosha oh, I see. so in, in Ayurvedic they call it dosha it's like okay you were born like this and that's you should live approximately to your constitution well in Tibetan medicine you can be born as a dosha but that's not really the goal to be that dosha for the rest of your life the goal for you is to have the three humors in balance. Right. Okay. So, so we all have the th three humors in us. Then. Yes. So we it's all not like we all have, but some of us have more of that humor than, right. than others. I see. Right, and it's an equilibrium, and they call it the psychophysical components of our bodies. The humor is, I guess, will be translated as a psychophysical aspect. And obviously in Tibetan medicine, they add the mind aspect of this because for them, mind training and mind understanding is very important. So kind of like we were talking about doshas and the humors, in Tibetan medicine, they believe that if you were born in a wind or vata environment or your constitution is wind, it means to them, it means that you're also going to have a lot of problems with desire, with wanting things too much. An attachment to things I see. and if you're into a pitta or bile then obviously they will correlate that with anger and hatred wow. there's a lot of hatred inside or that's wow. co coming from the next you know from your mental continuum into your body and with calf and phlegm they will call that stupidity <laughs> okay you know, not being able to learn new things well. So in a way, it's correlated to developmental delays. So some of that comes from the prev your previous life. Could some of it come from your mom, maternal and paternal influences too? Yeah, and according to the parents' polls, you can, they will, Tibetan doctors will prevent, will. Yes. Dr. Okay, and you're listening to WPKN Bridgeport, 89.5 FM, listener-supported free speech alternative radio. I'm Dr. Z, Dr. Eugene Zamperone, herbalist and naturopathic physician, and your host on the program, along with Maud Joseph. Maud, Maud's been quiet, but she's going to add stuff in a bit. <laughs> and our illustrious guest, Dr. Javier Palacios, a UB grad, naturopathic physician and scholar in Tibetan medicine. I mean scholar because he actually did his thesis on this. So um, we became uh, mentor-mentee, colleagues and friends over the years. And, and uh, you know, Javier is a great and promising physician. And this is a very interesting approach, Tibetan medicine, because it's true 
it's true holism. It really looks at many aspects of the person that Western medicine totally ignores. And so that's why I like these almost complete systems, which have, in the West have been kind of swept under the rug. So welcome back, Javier. Thank you. So why don't you follow up, uh, follow up with what you were going to get into at this point in the conversation? Yeah. Yeah. So now we're gonna get into the you know the fun aspect of how Tibetans doctors and diagnose and treat. So with a diagnosis, so for example, you come and see a doctor. There's three or four things that the doctors may do okay. to you. And obviously, the first one is observation and um, questions. You know, something like, basically will be like the interview. Your patient history, family history, all of the things they need to know as to why you're coming in for them. So that's something we're very familiar with. Yeah, that's like Western medicine. All mm -hmm. the disciplines have to glean information from the patients. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. But they might ask different different questions like right. what would be some unique questions they would ask you know the patient versus say a western trained doctor would definitely one of the biggest differences that they will ask will be how are you with food how how do you react after eating food do you feel how are your symptoms because obviously you're coming for a set of symptoms and then they will ask is your symptoms coming when you're eating food like half an hour after you're eating a meal or two hours later after you're eating a meal. Uh -huh. And according to those, it's going to be either one of the humors is going to be off or it could be a combination of both. Oh. Yeah. So, so food, that's, food so is food very and, important. And the symptoms it may produce seems to be extremely important. Okay. Yes. Uh, another aspect that they do is pulse diagnosis. And pulse diagnosis... We are very familiar with that from the Chinese tradition because what they will do is just they will grab your radial artery, which in, in, is in your wrist, and then just feel for pressure, depth, and quality of pulse. So, and then the Tibetans did learn that from the Chinese. Mm. Their pulse system and organs, even though they, they also have the same terminology as hollow and solid organs as the Chinese, the positions of the organs are a little bit different. So basically, just to for the listeners that may not understand pulse diagnosis, through you're, you're saying that through feeling the pulse, you, you don't just count the pulse, <laughs> you know, like they right. do in Western medicine. They just count it, but that there are qualities to the pulse that can help the practitioner understand what's going on with the patient. Right, and this is something that if you regular listeners want to do right now, it's just, you know, you can just grab your wrist and feel your pulse. Okay, so thumb side, right? Mm-hmm, on the thumb side. Thumb side is the radial pulse. Yep, take a minute to feel it, and if by the time you're feeling it, then take a, you know, a little look on your quality. How does it feel? Not just like how fast is it, but how is the feeling? Is it something that's... So you mean like does it knock your fingers off or is it right. very tiny and and timid? Right. Kind does of like you feel it and then it disappears. That would be like a sort of a timid pulse. Right. So is it an angry pulse? Is it a <laughs> <laughs> an angry pulse? Yeah, that's true. It could be. Uh, tr yeah, take the pulse of somebody after Mine's having a happy burst. <laughs> So it's like it's okay. the quality, you know. It's like, is it faint? Is it nice. okay. soft? Is it strong and mm -hmm. uh, wiry that they will come? Does it feel like a wire? And all of those kinds of pulses will tell you a little bit different about what you're experiencing and what type of problems you well, may be going Well, that must take through. lots of pulses to get to understand the nuances of patients. Right. And, yeah, during that time. And there's three different positions, right, that you put three different fingers, your uh, ring, middle, and index finger on the particular radial pulses, mm -hmm. on the positions, just like in 
TCM, traditional Chinese medicine, and even Ayurveda. And there's many, actually, many disciplines that do Mayans did pulse. So, so many, yes. so many traditions did the pulse. It's so amazing that Western medicine just feels for the pulse. Maybe they feel a couple qualities if it's they could feel an arrhythmia or mostly counted, but they really don't feel for these humoristic qualities with the pulse like these other ancient systems in medicine. That's one thing that's very different between yes. ancient systems and Western medicine. Yeah. Yes, and obviously pulse is, is a science and an art mm. because it, it takes practice. Obviously, we need to understand what the pulse feels like in order to get to that point because, you know, it's a science in the aspect that, you know, if I feel the pulse and then you, Dr. C, feel the pulse of somebody else, we should get approximately the same diagnosis based on that. Yes. And the art obviously will come with more advanced techniques, more clairvoyance, basically. And, ju and just an interesting um, aside to this, or story that supports this, is I remember hearing and reading about the Dalai Lama's personal physician came to New York, and doctors were skeptical that he could diagnose many of their patients. So without telling him anything about their history, he felt the pulse of nine, of, sorry, 100 patients. And do you know through the pulse and doing the other things that you'll discuss soon, he was he was 93.5% accurate, nailing people's diagnosis exactly what was going on with them just through those ancient technologies without anyone to I, I I don't find it fascinating because I know when I take people's pulse and tongue and do things like that I you know I could pretty much know what's going on too but I think the western doctors they're just astonished like mm -hmm. some type of witchcraft or some <laughs> type of something like how could they do that so anyway I just right. thought that was fascinating that they put it to the test is what I'm saying western scoffing uh, doctors put this put this doctor to the test and he was right on the money so right it's a very it. amazing art and science yeah and obviously it takes a lot of years of training and mm -hmm. Tibetan doctors nowadays do have to go through western medical School. learning biomedical yeah, learning teachings too. okay yeah and similarly to pulse diagnosis comes another type of diagnosis that Tibetan doctors tell you a whole they complete the picture of the patient is urine diagnosis mm. And it's, it's such a huge topic in the Tibetan world, how your urine tells you so much about the type of person, the type of diseases you're most likely going to get, and how your system is working at the moment without just involving your kidneys. Wow, that's fascinating. So what are some qualities of the urine that they look at? So very basic, if you... You know, going back to the three humors, the wind, the bile, and the phlegm, a wind type of urine will be very, very clear, almost, and it will have like a little bit of blue tinge in it, mm -hmm. and they will have a lot of bubbles. That, that will be more of a wind kind of issue. Oh. Um, a type of bile problem will be the urine will be very yellow, very dense, very the odor will be very strong. Strong, pungent, yeah. And in a way, that's we see that in when we are dehydrated, our urine tends to be very much like that because our bile, the warmth in the body, is overcoming everything. Yes, very much so. Yeah. yeah. And then in phlegm, the the urine will be um, very heavy, like it will have a lot of sediment in it. I see. Yeah. Because again, there's a lot of things that the body is trying to remove. A lot of fluids that the body has or sugar too them. somebody could be like if someone's real out of balance phlegm i think that would correlate somewhat to the biomedical diagnosis of diabetes right sort yes, of yes it's exactly and Interesting. and diabetes type 2 is a type of phlegm disorder in the tibetan world and sugar in the urine yeah right yeah so obviously they will be able to taste it and smell it 
Yeah, in the old days, the, even the Western doctors tasted the urine, mm-hmm. but they don't do that much <laughs> anymore. But so it's still part of Tibetan medicine to see all all aspects of the urine. Yeah, and the doctor will like sniff it. They oh, will move move the bubbles around. Sometimes they will put uh, substances like oils in it to see how the color changes, and all of that will give you some type of prognosis on what's going oh. on. And obviously, they can even give you a prognosis of whether this disease is going to go away or it's something that may be chronically oh. happening to you mm-hmm. and yeah so I think that's the basic understanding of so do, do they use the tongue to, do they look at the tongue too yeah, they like, like they do in TCM and Ayurveda do they look at the, the tongue actually they do they have an observation that's the other aspect of observation so they will look at your tongue basic just as far as I understand some Tibetan doctors will know the tongue really well. Others, they will just have a basic to see if it's wind, phlegm, or bile. Mm-hmm. But they will also look at the back of your ear to see how the skin looks. Also, the sclera, the white part of your eye. Mm-hmm. And obviously, according to the color, they will suggest them whether this is, again, is it one of the three humors or is it a combination of all of them? So in that part, they as they add them to the observation diagnosis. So say you have a patient, you know, with high blood pressure. Now, that's really a symptom. That's not really a cause. So a high blood pressure patient could fit into any or combinations of those humor imbalances. Exactly. So the person could have high blood pressure because they have a wind in balance. Mm-hmm. So how would they differentiate between the high blood pressure with the fire and then the phlegm? You know, they all have high blood pressure, so they all may be treated exactly the same by the western doctor put on metropolol or, you know, some type of other, you know, uh, calcium channel blocker or uh, things like lisinopril and things like that. You know, standard you know, this is the symptom. This is the way, is I, the treat way it. I treat it's it. It's very right. different in these types of medicines. Right. It's like we were talking about, right, a symptom. We're treating a symptom from a Tibetan point of view. In high blood pressure, according to the humor, it's going to, you may have the symptom of high blood pressure, but the cause is something else. Mm. For example, a wind type of individual, their high blood pressure could be from a state of alertness or a state of nervousness that they're on it for a while, like they can't calm themselves down. I see. A type of bile or fire type of person will be usually from anger or the fact that they don't drink enough liquids and they don't nourish their body with water and, um, well, yeah basically liquids mm-hmm, they're mm-hmm. deficient in oils liquids. too maybe yeah. yeah exactly and then with phlegm probably because they're very heavy so the heart is to working too hard to you know the blood's maybe thick with fats and right, lipids so and cholesterol and excess sugar all the glycation things that we always talk about that may play a big role in it too right yeah so a person with hypertension and retaining and water phlegm, maybe maybe they're retaining water and they are edema risk, type of thing yeah right? and, they, and they are at risk of congestive heart failure I see, and I even see. atherosclerosis because of all that fat that's accumulating in the, in right. the vessels so they so the tibetan doctors wouldn't stop it just you know bringing the pressure down they would continue to treat to to bring these other things out of back back into balance what what tools do they the tibetan doctors use to treat things yeah patients? so it this is where the next topic gets on into the treatments cool. and there are many kinds of treatments that they would use and they will um, scale it from least invasive to the most invasive the most invasive at that time when tibetan medicine was created was surgery but now they don't practice any more surgery I think it was because they did surgery on a llama and it didn't go well and I think the llama actually died from it and I think after that they didn't do any more surgery in the Tibetan world however they do the other 
treatments which I'll get right now so the first thing that they work well the first two things is diet and lifestyle okay which is you know this naturopathic physicians can relate to a lot which is a lot of the it's like they say about 60% of the problems is from diet and lifestyle even more um, another thing they will do is so if that doesn't work then the Tibetan doctor is going to move on to uh, medications and I just want to uh, say that medications in the Tibetan medicine is not medications that we call in conventional medicine medications for them is a mixture of herbs minerals semi-precious stones and sometimes even heavy metals into well, treating we want to talk about that yes <laughs> and if that doesn't work then they're going to resort to moxa and pressure points what they call external therapies so moxa is the heating right they use herbs to heat things yes right? moxa will be yeah will be used in specific acupuncture points or meridian points which is like a a correlate between ayurvedic and chinese so they don't use the needles like in chinese but do they apply the pressure like they do in ayurveda with the marma points which are like these you know energetic points around the body mm -hmm. so what they will do actually not exactly acupuncture what they will have is they call it the golden needle technique and what it is it's this very large acupuncture needle where the doctor um, obviously sterilizes it with fire and then touches specific points in the body to okay. get those um, healing moving so fluids moving and again if moxa doesn't work then they'll resort to bloodletting which was a bloodletting huh bloodletting yeah. there's in the four tantras they have a whole picture of the human body as to where are the specific bloodletting points and where are the bloodletting points that you should not ever do so to be so would they much. use would they make an incision and then use the vacuum cup like heat the cup and put the cup on just like similar the wet bloodletting there's wet bloodletting and dry bloodletting i know mm -hmm. yeah, yeah 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 very similar to that oh. sometimes they will use leech it, leeches leeches too which is okay. i think it's i think it's a more safer alternative than just using a knife to cut through the through the vessel and yeah so it is basically wow. all of those different techniques so one thing um we'll take a break in a bit but you mentioned using heavy metals and gems and things like that. Let's talk about gems. That's fascinating. So um, that's not used at least in Western medicine. Does this mean wearing certain gems to balance? Because I know in, in Ayurveda, they actually prescribe you to wear certain gems if you have different imbalances, like actually wear the jewelry. But this is actually consuming the yes, gems. Yes, this is okay. actually consuming them. So how do they do that? Javier. So in when it comes to gems, what they have to do and heavy metals is they go. So you're talking this, mercury, right? Arsenic, lead, arsenic. Really? So they're actually using some of these metals, which of course is why Western medicine has you know scoffed at some of these treatments because they feel that um, you get exposed to the metals and they're all dangerous, but you told me in, in your thesis that there's a way that they sort of transmute the toxicity of the metals mm -hmm. and they can make it more medicinal for the body. Yes, and to make it as short as I can is basically they they did a research on whether this compound called Zuota in Tibetan, Z-U-O-T-A, they did a study whether this medicinal which with plants and mercury in it mm. would either stay in the body or it will not so in the study obviously they they gave the patients according to their indication for the disease that they were having 
and they discovered that the mercury they ingested, everything came out. Through this medicine? Yes, through this medicine. The, wow. So the mercury, we would think that once you ingest mercury, it just stays in, in our bodies for good. Right. But it was not the case with this uh, Tibetan medicine. Wow. It actually came in and they measured it through the, through the urine. They were able to detect all of the small amounts of mercury so that was published that study and it was published and it wow. was and it is available to be read so how do you say that again zuata zuata that's the mercury that's the medication name oh that's the name of the medication with the herbs and the particular transmuted mm -hmm. mercury yeah and and obviously many tibetan doctors will not share the secret of how this is done wow <laughs> because wow. it's a okay. process of they call it detoxification of the metal, removing all of the possible toxicities. Well, we know they do that with herbs. There's a lot of herbs that are used. I, I'm actually writing a whole, doing a presentation in September on some herbs for pain. And, you know, one of the most effective herbs for pain is aconite. But it's also the most toxic herb known on the planet. And there's a way that they transmute it and age it and make it less toxic so that it works way more more effective than morphine and a lot of the drugs that people get addicted to but at the same time it doesn't seem to build up to toxic levels or at least they know makes it a lot less toxic mm -hmm. fascinating yeah yeah definitely so let's take a quick break and we'll be back with the conclusion of our interesting topic in tibetan medicine today you're listening, of course, to WPKN Bridgeport 89.5 FM. This is Integrated Wellness, the Natural House Call segment. Yes, Dr. Z. <laughs> uh, Maud. Yes, we're back with more of the Natural House Call, and we're happy to be here again taking beautiful musical breaks and delving into Tibetan medicine with Dr. Javier Palacios, and he is a naturopathic physician and did a lot of work, scholarly work in this field. And uh, we're going to continue our discussion. So we left off talking about transmutation of the, the metals in that interesting study. They use other things um, in their materia medica, which is sort of like what they use to treat people. I would assume they use a whole um, a plethora of herbs for the treatment of maladies and disharmonies and things like that. So is, are there any herbs that people would recognize, listeners out here would recognize? And there's, I guess there's some, you know, sort of local indigenous herbs that are maybe more used in Tibet itself. Correct, yeah. So there are some herbs that are only found in the Tibetan plateau. Right. So obviously something that would not be able to get access to. But w there's in the materia medica of which includes herbs, minerals, even animal parts like okay um, rhino horn or bear bile. Yeah, the uh, two the two the two things that are restricted now. Very That's restricted. Sure, yeah. <laughs> However, there are some very common herbs and plants and spices that we can use in our everyday lives, and these are just some of the things I was able to write. So. The very common one, dandelion, that we see, mm. it's a common weed here in this area. And obviously in Tibetan medicine, well, in Western medicine or herbal medicine, we use it for um, hypertension or sometimes as a diuretic to remove excess fluid in our bodies using the leaves. Right. In Tibetan medicine, they will just mash up the the leaves and the flower and then use it as a wound healer mm. so wow, any kind of yes. which kind of makes sense and it does work i believe in that yeah aspect. i was using i was um it's part of the famous chinese formula for um herbal ice so you know mm. in there's an old saying in china ice is for dead people <laughs> <laughs> you ever hear that one yeah, because they don't think that when you get hurt, you should put ice on things. I was going to do, a, I'm going to do a whole show on pain and the Chinese aspect of how they treat pain. But dandelion is one of the herbs in the 
six or seven herbal ice formula. Interesting. And it's topical, not internal. It's actually, you know, one thing I love about these ancient systems of medicine is they really delve into the, the whole art of poultices and plasters and liniments, whereas, you know, in American medicine, well, ice is a poultice. It's probably one of the only poultices we use. Mm -hmm. um, maybe we use, you know, betadine and Band-Aid over it or something like that, and some poultices, maybe calamine lotions, but we don't really use the poultices like the ancient medicines do. So it's interesting, dandelion is in, is in, and it's great. I love to see that dandelion grows in Tibet. It's, uh, you know, we try to eradicate dandelions on our lawn by putting pesticides on it. You ain't gonna get rid of dandelions. Yeah, don't. Might as well stop, <laughs> stop now. You know, just use it as medicine. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and the other one is that we're very familiar with is Berberis aristata or Berberis. Yes, that's like what that's Oregon grape or. Barberry, which is a noxious, they call it a noxious plant, all in the forest. Um, ticks like to hang out in the barberry area, so you got to be careful when you're hiking. But you can, we could be harvesting that and making it into medicine. Mm -hmm. And in the way that herbalists here they use it, it's usually as a bitter to help with the digestive juices. And in Tibetan medicine, they will make that into eye drops to help with your vision really because it decreases the excess heat in the eyes because the eyes is like an organ of fire and bile ah uh, that's something i'm gonna look into yeah definitely and the other one is nutmeg a very common spice nutmeg yes and what they use it for is from depression and i actually have a little story on along with that that comes down to Indonesia where a king lost his wife and the doctors were able to give him a lot of lot of nutmeg throughout uh, like a month or two and and then they wrote down the results it's like yeah he was better so nutmeg was indicated for depression coming from a heartbreak wow interesting so never knew that thank yes, you yes very interesting nutmeg and the other one is obviously f nettles, very, very common weed here that we see it grow. And in the Tibetan world, they use it for cancer. Interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any kind of tumors. And they also say that some Tibetan yogis who go into the mountains to live on their, by themselves, they would just nourish their bodies with this, the leaves of the nettles because they're so nutrient dense. And sometimes they wouldn't even, they would not need to eat food for months sometimes because of the richness of the nettles. Yeah, you can make a great soup, tea, great wild green. Mm -hmm. We have some, if people want some, <laughs> here in the garden in Bridgeport. It's getting out of control, so we have to harvest it and use it for soup. So. Yep. <laughs> Wow, that's interesting. So, those are some of the the herbs that are used. Now, have um, have you tell me some experience of maybe working with some patients or clients that you may have had? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I definitely maybe a case study because that's kind of cool. That kind of ties it in with the listeners that can really see themselves sometimes in the case studies. We have about ten more minutes left in the program. You know. Yeah. So to make it, um, definitely, I've used it for myself, and I've seen it work using it for myself. Um, with clients, you know, who are at this point in Pennsylvania, and then some people are um, online for the most okay. part. It's something okay. that I want to get this going, try to get sure. an online audience more for patients. Uh, one of them was somebody who has diabetes, obviously very common condition that many people experience here and he was taking three medications including for his high blood pressure because he was developing that and we worked on three stages 
So the first thing we did is obviously get down those numbers. Well, what was his constitution? What was his? Was he like more the fire, the phlegm, the wind? He was definitely a mix. A mix of two. Um, this it was a mix of like wind and bile, his constitution, but his problem was phlegm. He had a lot of accumulated phlegm. He was very sedentary. Yeah. In a way, you know, he worked a lot in as a nurse, but not, it was still was not enough for him to be on his own in the aspect of you know losing weight he was very unmotivated very very sedentary once work was done and so he was exhausted it's like this whole treadmill where you know he works hard he's exhausted he has excessive phlegm so he's not motivated to right. work yeah i could see that being a quagmire particularly if that's your constitution yeah yeah so obviously he <clears throat> the diabetes it was just a matter of time that he developed it and he did develop it after like a year of having that type of um, lifestyle did he eat lots of refined foods and <clears throat> things like that 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 would be suspect possibly and exactly he used to be a very type of salty person to eat but now he started becoming more of a sweet tooth oh. as time progressed so it's kind of like the whole naturopathic saying you are what you eat and it became to the point that he ate so much sugar that he couldn't burn he it off. He couldn't burn it all off anymore. Okay. So, obviously, the biggest challenge in this aspect is the lifestyle changes, the diet changes. But I've noticed, the because with medicines, with um, botanical medicines, using herbal compounds, you know, herbal compounds, they can be used Tibetanly or herbalist or in a herbalist western perspective they will still work but from my perspective in the tibetan style is the lifestyle and behavior changes and with behavioral changes i'm asking him to go out and and do some sort of meditative practice and for a type of a phlegm type of individual who has the phlegm problem you know that's the imbalance the best type of meditations for them is to move, do some type of movement meditation. Give me some, give me some examples of that, the, like Tai Chi or something like that. So, <clears throat> type of phlegm will be more of a person who needs to move, who needs to walk, or obviously with running it's a little bit more difficult to meditate while you're running because it requires more practice and more awareness in your body. But the walking is actually something that has been, it can work very well. Walking meditation on a sunny day will be perfect mm -hmm. because you're trying to burn off the excess mm -hmm. fluids. Um, tai Chi will be great f meditative practice for somebody who is more of a wind problem, who has more of a wind is issue because you know, the, the wind type of person, they are very, when they sit, they are, they can't, they can't stay still. So their mind, yeah, the mind, they get is. antsy, so their mind goes everywhere. Mm -hmm. So they need some sort of slow movement. Even I with see. exercise, they need to have a very just small type of exercise. You don't want to do overdo exercise on a wind individual. Right. And, but obviously in, in this patient's case, you know, exercise for him has to be strenuous. So he has walking, to move. strenuous walking, and would you have them think of something as part of the meditation? Yeah, the, the, that's the training aspect that I've been working with him oh. throughout this time, and I teach him about, without sounding too spiritual or too out there, um, teaching him about the, the subtle bodies, the energy bodies. So he's committing to a routine because in in this phlegm, they tend to be non-committal and want to just they're, they're only committed to the couch. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> they need to get out and of that TV. couch. And TV. They okay. can't grow roots in the couch. They That's have to their grow routine. Roots outside. Yeah. That's become their routine. Okay. Yeah.